not sure why I don't hate whites. If I were to take the experiences that I have had to endure that were degrading, I could make a case for hating white people based on where and how I lived. I'm not sure why I'm not bitter. I can't explain that. Columbus, Mississippi meant to me a totally segregated city. If I needed to come downtown and I needed to ride a public uh, vehicle, uh, that was a sign that told me where I could sit. When I got off that vehicle, if I needed to have a drink of water, I had to go to that specified for colored or white and I could only drink out of the one that was labeled colored. If I needed to go to a bathroom, I had to go to a bathroom that was labeled for color. You were likely to be told, nigga, you go over here. You can't be here. It didn't have to be the law enforcement that would tell you what you could or could not do. Any white person could do that. And that created a fear that is indescribable. That was the kind of town this was, and that's the way you live. When I came home from World War II, Having fought in Iwo Jima and Okinawa, I walked up this very sidewalk in Marshall County, Mississippi, and I walked up these very steps. And I went into the registrar's office, and the clerk said to me, what do you want? And I said, in my Navy uniform, I'd like to vote. And her response to me was, niggas don't vote here. My name is Joseph C. Lanier II. I was born March 25th, 1926, in rural Columbus, Mississippi. way now out to out to where I was born uh, that's gonna be about six miles my father would come to town uh, maybe every other Saturday uh, in a horse and wagon this was not paved it was a dirt road and you could see a car coming way down the road because it was big, making dust and we'd run down to the road just to see the car pass. This is where I was born. The house is gone. And the two magnolia trees that was in the side yard are gone. The memory uh, that I have I see the cow pen to the left as we go out of the yard area of the property where the hogs and the cows were kept, where my father would, and mother would go to milk the cow. 
probably 50 yards away from the, from the cow pen was the barn where we kept the horses. My father had two horses. Uh, one was old Prince and one was old Pete. My mother made most of our uh, cl clothing uh, and she worked in the field with my father, but I, I wasn't aware of that being such a hard life for him at that time because we were never hungry. This reminds me of those long rows that I used to look down in the hot sun and say, do they ever end? I remember a lot of the people that were picking cotton when I was growing up singing spirituals as they would pick cotton down the rows. And one of the ones that I remember so well had to do with Moses and bringing the children out of the, to the promised land. And it went something like, go down, Moses, way down in Egypt's land. Tell old Pharaoh to let my people go. You always understood that you were different. On this very street, when I went to the Princess Theater to watch Gone with the Wind, I had to go up to the crow's nest. You were always less because you had to go to separate entrances. And the ticket agent was always white. There was no representation of, of, of my ethnicity during those periods. The biggest injustice I saw as I grew up here uh, involved another teenager. And they put a stick through his arms and through his legs and they tied him and they set him up on his all fours and they began to beat him. They beat this boy so badly that the skin became to come off him like you would peel a rubber potato and the peeling would come off a potato. As they beat this boy, I noticed an airplane flying over and uh, they said, oh, I bet they're watching this. And they said it with such glee that I can't, I can't describe the emotion that I felt. My grandfather was a slave. His name was Watt Barnett, born 1852, give or take a year. My mom was a beautiful lady. She was a great lady. I loved her very much. My dad was, was just a marvelous father. My family viewed white people um, with caution because it was a matter of survival. But it was not a conversation that they had with us about how we were supposed to react to people, white people. They taught us how to behave by the way they behaved. Uh, my mom died when I was 14. I miss her today because I didn't have her when I was growing from 14 into manhood. We are now in the cemetery where my mother, my brother, and my father is buried. Nobody has taken care of this cemetery. Moving away, having no financial 
uh, means in a general sense to come back to make sure or to hire somebody to keep up the cemetery. This is what happens. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to find those th three graves. And I'm uh, a little sad about that, really. I really am. But at least they know I tried. At least they know. <sighs> That's him. This is my father. And this is my mother. Thank God. I know how to, I know where they are now. Before I die, I'm going to have a headstone put here. This cemetery means to me a connection to a connection A connection to three people that represents the kind of person that I am today. <sighs> okay. <sighs> okay. Now you know you're not forgotten. I volunteered for the United States Navy at 17. I decided to join a service because my father was having difficulty with uh, finding work. I had two younger sisters that he needed to take care of. I could go to the service and send him an allotment. I was two years behind my peers in school, so I was in it second semester of my of the ninth grade. I left home sometimes in 1944. After basic training at Great Lakes, Illinois, a commander of our group had been assigned. And then almost without warning, he said to us, and I quote, I have learned over my time that there's only two kinds of niggers. A dead nigger and a good nigger. And we don't want no dead ones. We're gonna do our part to help with this war. I was devastated. Boarded ship, never seen a ship before, never seen an ocean before. Out in the ocean, I began to see San Francisco move away. That didn't bother me until San Francisco dropped off behind the horizon, and it just scared the hell out of me. I thought, where is San Francisco gone? I wasn't even aware that the world was round. Spent about eight months on Pearl Harbor, and was transferred to the 23rd Special Navy Seabees. Then I spent about three weeks at two different camps and went aboard ship. And 30 days later, we arrived at the Battle of Iwo Jima. On Iwo Jima, segregation was not a great problem for me. I had grown up with it all my life. I was aware of it. Uh, I was not ecstatic about it. It was there, but I had learned to ignore it. They really didn't know what to do with us. There was not much training. They kind of felt like that, you know, they won't fight. 
That wasn't true, but that was the thought process. Looking back over what we did was build roads, build airports, unload ships, take care of storing our goods. That came later than the frontline people that had to take the beach and was sometimes mowed down because of the enemy at the high ground. So we didn't have to do that. And so the one time in my life that I felt that my race was a benefit to me, that it probably saved my life in the sense that since we were thought of as not being able to fight, we were not on the front lines. I boarded the train on January 2nd, 1946, on my way home. Overnight, we traveled and got into Denver the next morning. When I got off the train here and walked into the station, and the first thing that crossed my mind was there were no signs. There was no signs that said colored waiting room, white waiting room. There were no sections that I had to sit. There were no separate water fountains. And that was overwhelming to me. It was just an amazing um, difference to me as opposed to how and where I was raised and through the whole part of my two years in the service. Outside I saw that they were washing the streets. I'd never seen that before. And the city was so clean. I came out of the train station and I saw this drugstore across the street not knowing what to do with the three-hour layover that I had. I walked across here and came into the drugstore and ordered an ice cream cone. Being from Mississippi, uh, I didn't know whether I could sit at the counter. The clerk, the white young woman, sensed that and said to me, why don't you have a seat and enjoy your ice cream cone? It was like lifting the world off my shoulders. And I thought, this is a place that I want to live. Seeing this today is very sad for me. We're standing on the campus of the MI College, Mississippi Industrial College, where I went to high school after World War II, uh, so that I would have the kind of credits I needed to enter college. The, the institution has been closed, and that is a great sadness. The memories I have of this institution, the preparedness that they allowed me to have so that I could go on to college and on with my life, uh, will always be there. But there will always be a, always be a question of what if it had continued in existence and other young people would have the same opportunity that I had? And that can't happen now. I have such a, an affinity for, for New Orleans for some reason. It's just different from anything that I had ever been exposed to. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. I came here to Xavier University because I had applied to pharmacy school at Howard University in Washington, D.C. And I got a letter back from them saying to me they no longer had a pharmacy school. Xavier meant, meant to me uh, the opportunity to get an education that I never thought that I would be able to get. When I graduated, uh, my father and my nephew was late getting here. Uh, we go up to kiss the bishop's ring and he presents us with a degree and we turn to the audience and move the tassel on the right, to the right side 
And when I did that, I looked out to my left and there was my father sitting in the middle half of the audience. And the pride that I saw on his face was indescribable. His son, that he never thought would be able to do this, was now graduating from college. It was very difficult to get a job here. In the front of this building was a pharmacist called the American Drugstore. I walked in to ask if they needed a pharmacist. He said, well, we do need a, we do need a pharmacist, uh, but if we hire you, you will have to go upstairs where we fill out prescriptions, but you will not be allowed to come down to the first floor and wait on customers. After I was turned down here, uh, I went to the Picayune newspaper to uh, see if there were any ads in the paper for a pharmacist, and there was one. I called it, and he said, yes, uh, I do need a pharmacist. Uh, when can you be here? I said, I can be there within an hour. He came out, looked at me. I told him who I was. I was a pharmacist that had called him. And his exact words, if I had known you were black, I could have saved you a trip. When I didn't get this job, is that where do I go from here? You're gonna have to go someplace else. It just isn't here for you. It was always in the back of my mind. The visualization of sweeping streets and remembering that the lady told me to have a seat and enjoy my ice cream cone. I uh, got an interview at National Jewish Hospital. I applied and was accepted. This was an ex extremely uh, satisfying uh, situation for me because I didn't come here looking for this position. I found it after I arrived here and it gave me the opportunity to fulfill my dream of coming back to Denver to live. In 1956, I'm the director of pharmacy at National Jewish Hospital. I see my wife for the first time and I want to meet her. There were several problems. One, patients and employees cannot fraternize. Two, she's from Oklahoma, I'm from Mississippi. And three, I'm black and she's white. The first time I saw her, she had on some jeans rolled up at the bottom, some white socks, and penny loafers. And I thought that was the sexiest thing I'd ever seen. And I had to figure out some way to, to talk to her without getting fired. But we did meet. Eula and I married in 1957. It was 1972 before I felt comfortable enough to go with her to her hometown in Sulphur, Oklahoma. I uh, said to my wife on the way to Oklahoma, if we get stopped, I'm gonna be your chauffeur. It was humorous, but I really meant that. We're going to the first house we bought in 1959. I was at uh, work at National Jewish and I looked through the paper and they had the house listed at $100 down. That was a misprint in the paper. It wasn't $100 down, it was $1,000 down. And I said, well, there's no way I, I, can, I got $1,000. He said, well, if you can come up with $500, um, maybe we could make the deal. 
When we first moved in, it was strange to me that the very next day or two, signs went up for sale because this was an all-white neighborhood. There were uh, areas of Denver I could not move because of my uh, ethnicity. We were looking for a different house in West Denver. And there was a development there that we chose to go and look at um, show homes. And we went in with our children. They kicked us out. There was no other reason other than race. We didn't push being an interracial couple. If you are expecting trouble, uh, you usually can find it. And we chose to recognize that what we were doing was not totally acceptable. So we were aware that we didn't push that to cause another person to react to us. When I joined the service at 17, my specific reason for joining was because of the lifestyle that we had to live in Mississippi. As I became an adult and began to analyze what our country is about, I realized that we are free But it's at a price. You have to defend freedom. Where are you going? I'm going to Guam. And then? And then to Iwo Jima. I'm looking forward to going back to Iwo Jima as a symbolism of my pride of being a member of the 23rd Special Seabees that I served when I was there. I'm looking forward to going back. In February of 45, we were on our way from Pearl Harbor to a destination unknown. And we stopped here in, in Guam. We were passengers on the ship, a merchant ship, uh, so we didn't get off the ship. And I wondered what Guam would look like. But we didn't get a chance to see that back in 1945. Bunkers were constructed with these blast walls that formed an L to the entrance. So that if any high explosive came in, it was stopped essentially by this. That's entirely typical. You'll see that on Iwo Jima, you'll see it on Peleliu. So it's called blast wall construction. It's important for me to go back to Iwo Jima because given where I was raised until I was 17 years old, the word patriotic was not part of my vocabulary. It is going to be a tremendous experience for me. As I sit here this morning, the anticipation is tremendous. It's not emotional. It's a vision of going back to see where I lived in Foxhole for two months in the bloodiest battle of the South Pacific during World War II. And I'm just anxious to see that. And all of the time that I was in Iwo Jima, about six months, I never went to the top of Mount Sarabachi for some reason. And particularly, I want to walk down to the ocean. That's coming in to the black volcano ash and see the little 
intricacies that the water makes on the beach. That's what's going through my mind right now. Thank you. This 737 is equipped with four exit doors. So left hand side first and we'll switch it around and uh, fly around the island on the right side. Good morning here in Iwo Jima. The local time here is approximately 7.53 a.m., one hour behind Guam. We'll be catching for the next few minutes. Well, I'm back on Iwo Jima, a place that I never thought I'd see again when I left it six to seven years ago. I saw death in Iwo Jima. It was hard not to. The island is so small. When they came out, they would come out with their hands up, and they would come out with hand grenades and with the pins out so that they would enter into the um, people that were standing around waiting for them to uh, surrender and blow themselves up and, and, and also the people that were around them. I'm now at the top of Mount Suribachi. Uh, I've never been here before. When we were here securing the island, I never had a desire to come to the top. We're looking at the volcanic ash beach that we came in on, the 23rd Special Navy Seabees, five days after fighting started. It was just beyond that jutting out into the ocean there, we started building foxholes there and built them to the north. And we stayed there for two months. When I was on Iwo Jima, we were segregated. It was 1948 when President Truman gave an executive order that said no more. And from that day forward, there has been seismic improvements in the career ladders of African Americans in our armed services. And that, that says to us why this country is the greatest country in the world. To the best of my knowledge, I am the first African American to come back to Iwo Jima after uh, the war. It's a sense of pride to me that I am apparently representing all of the 23rd Special Seabees that served here with me. I'm sad that my father is not here so that I could see the pride on his face of his son making a contribution to democracy. My father uh, lived until I was 37, uh, but my relationship with him was just different than, than it was with a mother. He was always there. He was like a rock of Gibraltar, but he was not an emotional man. Nobody had to tell me that my father cared about what happened to me. I live today by most of what he taught me and how he lived his life to show me how to relate to my fellow man. At the cemetery I visited seeking to find the graves of my mother, my father, and my brother was extremely emotional for me because I had tried to find those graves yeah. before. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. More than once and was not able to. I'm assuming that there's a grave next here to my brother. The one thing that I was sad about is that the upkeep of that cemetery was of such nature that it exuded disrespect to me, and I'm hopeful that one day we can remedy that.
when I go back to Mississippi today, it's not like it was when I grew up there. If you had told me when I was 16 that in Mississippi I would be able to go back to my hometown of Columbus and go any place that I want to go, I would have asked you, what are you smoking? Being here today is exhilarating to me. I never thought that I would be standing on the first tee hitting a golf ball at the Columbus Country Club today. I never thought that was possible. That felt awful good. I want to tell you, I could only come out here when I was a caddy when I was a boy. And uh, I did caddy here once. This guy was a duffer. I followed him around the course. I couldn't find some of his balls. And when we got finished, he gave me 25 cents. And I decided caddying is not for me. I never intended to go back to Mississippi. When I was discharged from the Navy, I made a decision that I was going to go to college and I had to go back to high school. I was only in the second semester of, my, of the ninth grade uh, and I'm 20 years old. So I was behind. I should have been finishing college at 22. I'm now 26. An old cliche that is really true, everything happens for a reason. So I finally settled in a place that I wanted to be in Colorado and met my wonderful wife and we have two great kids. Uh, so I wouldn't change what I've done for anything in the world. I want to be remembered as a person who respects the rights of another person to exist. I want to be remembered as a good person, a person that makes no judgments of another person, a person that loves his family, a person that made a life for his children so that their life could be better than the life that I had when I was growing up. Of all of the trials and tribulations that I have had to deal with, the emotion of anger and bitterness seems pointless to me. The only explanation I can give to it is to remember how I was raised, how my parents taught us not to hate. Hate and bitterness do not solve anything. No one suffers more than you, the one who, who, who perpetuates the hate. We made a lot of progress. And it tells me that the American people will take a look at their country and say, this is wrong and we need to change it. That is why I'm proud to be an American. I really consider myself a fortunate man. My brothers and sisters, we believe that all the ties of friendship and affection which knit us as one throughout our lives do not unravel with death. And that God always remembers the good we have done and forgives us our sins. We pray today asking God to gather Joseph, Sevilla, and Ira to himself. Bless these gravestones which will be laid to mark the graves of these people. May they rest here in peace until the Lord awakens them to eternal life and may they have everlasting life and rejoice in, with you in your saints forever and ever. And we ask you this through Christ our Lord, amen. And I want you to know, Papa, that I, 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 I never saw 
a man with so much pride that his son, the only son of the five boys and two girls to finish college. I have never forgotten that pride that I saw on your face. And it made me know that you cared about what happened to me. And mom, you know, I, I never talked to you about how much I cared about you because you left, you left us when we were so young. But I know you would be proud, proud of, of what we have accomplished as your children. I want to sprinkle a little of the ashes that came from Mount Sarabachi off of Iwo Jima when I served there in 1945. And I know you both would be so proud that I served our country and I came home alive and would have spent a lot of years with both of you with the experience that I, that I gathered as I became a man. And this is my thank you for that. Thank you for being my parents. The pride of family that you bestowed on us was absolutely incredible and we are better people because of it.